Welcome back to the Armchair Generals, where we talk 40K's news, tactics, and lore. And so much more. We hope you enjoy the video. Welcome back to Armchair Generals. Thank you for joining us today. Today we will be continuing our discussion on the 40K factions. Uh, we're going to begin the Xenos races today. And first up are the Greenskins, the Orcs. Uh, El Scacho, do you want to take it away with the Orcs? Absolutely. Uh, my One of my personal armies, probably one of the top three favorite factions to me in 40K in general. Um, they are all that is fun with 40K, in my opinion. Uh, you've got big, crazy vehicles. You've got a little bit of Mad Max thrown in there. Um, you've got mushroom people. Um, you've got, I mean, if you think about it, they shed spores, they grow in, you know, underground gestation chamber things that, you know, they're very, very fungoid. Um, and insert dad joke here. Um, they're really <laughs> fun guys. There you go. You uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, no, they are hands down one of my favorite factions. So you, they've got, um, Basically, any shade of green that you like, you can paint them. Um, so they go anywhere from really dusty, like army green, all the way up to bright, you know, anime slash comic book style green stuff. Um, they've got uh, big stompy war suits and big ramshackle vehicles that look like they would fall apart. Orc stuff works because orcs think it can. That's their special magic power. Well, one of their special magic powers is 40K. They can also make their head explode if they don't make their own heads explode. Um, but they and they just basically bellow uh, war cries and charge across the battlefield as fast as they can, shooting guns because they make cool noises and um, red goes faster. And yep, lots of red. Uh, <laughs> you could oh, there's so much so much fun to be had in the orcs uh, army, um, and you've got. Everything from big stompy mechs uh, all the way down to the little grots and Gretchen and whatever you want to call them. Um, basically, they goblins of the 40k universe. They use them as general, you know, get uh, gophers and snacks and um, and mechanics. And actually, they shoot better than orcs too. So they're actually kind of useful in the army in general. And they ride around in trash cans. They can, yes, killer cans, which are basically a bunch of Gretchen, Grotz, Gabos, whatever you want to call them, got together and said, you know what, we want a big stoppy thing too. So they make an imitation of an orc death dread, and um, it's a little bit smaller. And actually, I find them slightly more effective on the field <laughs> because they move about the same rate as a uh, kill or as a. Uh, Death Dread, but uh, they're more accurate with their shooting. So you can actually pray that they hit something once they're shooting with their weapons. And they get cool guns like uh, Grotzukas, where it's just basically a blunderbuss in 40K. Packed, packed with spoons, knives, forks, boards, nuts, bolts, nails, and all nails. <laughs> just pick things. And they also have squigs, which are basically legs with mouths and they use them as pets slash mobile snacks i mean there's no doubt that orcs are the comedy relief of the 40k universe yeah something that is sorely lacking in recent iteration of 40k but i know i personally love the orc magic thing things work because orcs believe they do i oh, i would like that. their vehicles go faster because they paint them red because they believe they go faster when they're painted red yep that's right and I, because red ones go faster I mean, an orc can take could take apart one of my my shelves that's you know a steel shelf and and dump it into the engine compartment of a of a vehicle, weld it all together, and be like, it goes fast now, and it'll work because they think it does. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, uh, all orcs have an obligatory Cockney accent, by the way. It's it's canon. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I love orcs. I've started to collect them a couple of times before, but never really gone too, too deep. But I do love the lore and the theme of the orcs. They are, I will say that, they are kind of a hard army to collect for a couple of reasons. Um, 
A, there's a lot of stuff you've got to buy. I mean, if nothing else, you've got to boy, buy a boatload of boys and Gretchen. Um, maybe not some of your bigger stuff. Um, cool thing, though, is you can literally go into your friendly local gaming shop's used uh, shelf, if they have one, and buy any vehicle you want uh, from any faction you want and orcify it. I have literally seen orc versions of every single vehicle in the game that is in current production. I mean, I've seen orc versions of Land Raiders. I saw somebody made a, a rhino that they made it look like a bunch of orcs were holding up the pieces of the armor and walking in formation to make it look like a rhino. Um, I saw a uh, raider one time that somebody put a, a tank tread on the bottom of, like a dark elder, or sorry. Uh, oh Drukari, my gosh, that'd be awesome. Drakari yeah. Raider. Oh, they're, they're always Dark Eldar in our hearts. I know. <laughs> yeah. You uh, can uh, take Tau vehicles and, you know, slap a rudimentary tread system on them. Or shoot, orcs have teleporters and, uh, and you know, add some helicopter blades on top of a devil fish. And there you go, orc transport. I want it to take a um, an orc battle wagon and a unit from the AOS range, the Caradron Overlord's Ironclad ship, and I want it to combine them together and just put a bunch of um, uh, freebooters on it and use there that as go. like their pirate ship. That's awesome. That would <laughs> I would, cool. yeah, that would be that would really be, cool. That would be I'm, their battle wagon. I mean, in, in Forge World makes a Shinor uh, Warcopter that can hold twenty boys, and it looks like a actual like dual rotor Chinook from real life except for with missile wings and lots of orcs hanging off of it. I like the floaty dwarf orc vehicle idea. I might pirate that to make a floaty space. I, mean, I don't even know if it was going to float. I think I was still going to use the treads of the ironclad. It would just be more pirate shipy looking. The tre Using the treads on that would be awesome. <laughs> It's literally and, a boat with treads. And then it's already got <laughs> cannons and stuff on it, so it would just look really cool. Yeah. See, there you go. There's there's how you uh, make your 40K vehicle with a boat there, El Scotcho. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I just mentioned that, too. So, yeah, I might pirate that. To make that. So, my oh. dream for a Space Wolf drop ship is a long uh, Viking long ship. Sorry. Yeah. This totally doesn't belong in this segment. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, El Scotto has been wanting to convert one of the flying dumpsters that the Space Wolves use into a, uh, a Viking longship. He wants to chop off everything forward of the engines and glue a Viking longship kit on there. And call it a Space it, Wolf transport. It would be cool. Well, good space luck. Wolves. Logan already rides in a sled that looks like that. And it's not that great looking. <laughs> no, I know. But uh, Space Wolves were. A little bit of comedy relief back in the day too. Uh, they had some of the goofier things in forty days. Vikings, pretty much. So, um, all right. Well, uh, moving on from orcs, um, as the great destroyer. Uh, next, we have the great devourer. We have the Tyranids. Uh, the Tyranids are a menace. They're they're an extra galactic race that absorbs genetic traits from their prey. Um, so from, for instance, the common themes within them, you'll see like uh, biovores are commonly believed to be adapted from orc DNA. Um, Tyranid Tyrant Guard are commonly believed to be adapted from space marine DNA, things like that. Um, they absorb traits from their prey, adapt them and incorporate them into the hive mind. They consume all biological matter on a planet. When they move on from a planet, it is a desolate wasteland. Um, they did come from outside of the galaxy. There are multiple hive fleets uh, at, that have entered the galaxy from different points, uh, which gives you a good reason to be able to fight any army out there. Um, but the, the Great Devourer, they do work as a true hive mind. They work in complete synchronicity. Every organism in the Tyranid race has a purpose. And they, they fulfill that purpose. There's no individuality. Um, and Tyranids, when they move on from a planet, all the Tyranid organisms jump in basically a giant soup and they get dissolved and the biomatter gets retrieved by the ships. 
and then they move on to the next planet and reconstitute the armies while they're in transit. Um, they are a massive threat to the Imperium and all the biological races of 40k. Honestly, if the Necrons are smart, they just let them clean the galaxy out and then take over once they're gone. The Necrons want to munch everybody's souls. Yeah, but the, the Necrons are a good source of iron iron uh, supplement for the Tyranids, so they're going to go after them too. Not if they stay dormant under the ground. <laughs> the Necrons are too prideful for that. Yeah, they are. True. Sure. Um, but all Tyranid invasions are presaged by gene stealer cults. Well, not all, but many of them are presaged by gene stealers and gene stealer cults, which prep a planet ahead of time. Uh, Nova, would you like to uh, go over the gene stealer cults? So think of um, gene stealer cults. They are actually the one exception to the hive mind. They have almost full autonomy. Um, from the hive mind, but the hive mind at any point can say, no, you're under our control. But while most um, Tyranid creatures have to be within synapse range of a controller beast, which basically is like a, um, a Wi-Fi router that is giving the army signal, the gene sealers each have one inbuilt in, so they're able to function, and it's called brood telepathy. So they're able to function as independent operators or as small stealth squads. Um, these creatures will, um, they will hide upon cargo ships, derelict space stations, space hulks, um, comets, anywhere you can think of these things will um, stow themselves and they will land on a planet, they will assess the planet, and they will start finding the dregs of the society. They will capture them down in usually sewer systems or subway tunnels and they will hypnotize them and implant a they will basically impregnate the host with gene sealer embryos and then once this happens the new host will give birth to a gene stealer and host hybrid and so eventually the gene stealer cult will they'll just keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying you'll hear um Sometimes it's like the deliverance music from the banjos from deliverance. And eventually there'll be enough gene stealers that they will start uh, infiltrating the workforce. So maybe mining shift A is all cultists. Um, maybe that dumb politician, oh, he's a cultist. Maybe that um, PDF leader or guard general, well, his staff or he himself is a cultist or she's a cultist. And eventually, when they feel the psychic surge of a Tyranid fleet entering uh, the system or getting near, so all Tyranid fleets are preceded by a psychic bubble, um, they will actually host a giant uprising to throw the planet into disarray and chaos just to make it easier for the Tyranid invasion to happen. And they think they're like some... Uh, mega revolution rebellion going on little do they know once the tyranids get there the tyranids themselves are just going to either destroy them eat them discard them make them jump into the gene pool be like hey no you're just biomass sorry dummies <laughs> um and while all that's happening the actual peer strain gene scissors that originally infiltrated the planet they're hightailing it out because they they have a self-survival mechanism that the hive mind has installed in them to not go into that suit. They want to keep spreading and then start the cycle all over again. Usually the first gene stealer that invades a planet becomes what's called the patriarch. After yeah, what one, one will become a, a main the main leader or so. And they usually worship that as like a deity or a god. Yep. And they uh, that one is also has the ability, at least in the novels, I don't know about in game if it has any psychic abilities, but they basically can use that gene stealer patriarch to call in a psychically call a Tyranid Splinter Fleet towards the planet that they're inhabiting so that when it becomes ripe for, uh, you know, easy pickings, basically, they can summon those Tyranids to come in and uh, mop it up and absorb everything very easily 
Um, yes, the, the Patriarch will develop nascent psychic powers. They're not like the strongest psychers in the game, but as its brood of cultists just grows and grows and grows, they will send out a beacon that a uh, Tyranid fleet is constantly like scanning and searching for. I'm like, oh, there we go. There's a planet. It's got plenty of food and we already have uh, our in-source. And they're, they're, these cults, there's the work of generations. Uh, it's not like this all happens, you know, in six months or anything like that. So you know, cults, is, this could be 20, 40 years in the making. Yeah. 40K moves on a slow scale. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's very grinding. And then um, the best thing is, too, is it, it's so insidious because as the Tyranid fleet comes, Everyone who can is trying to book it off planet because they know what kind of horrors are coming. Mm -hmm. So it just creates this mass confusion of chaos. And not only will be all the people are trying to exit the planet, the cultists are rebelling, but the uh, pure strange gene centers just have that super easy time of stowing away on that next cargo ship and just jumping system. Yep. Yeah, they're they're a pretty insidious threat. Yeah. They definitely, you know, lurk from the shadow, lurk in the shadows, you know, strike from them, um, and they play that way on the table too. They, oh, they're they're amazing on the table. They they break the whole rule of forty k of everyone has to set up their army with genes that are cult. It's kind of like the movie Alien. You just put what they call blit chips out, and then um, during a certain point of the game, you just reveal all the blit chips at once. You're like boom, here's my alien hordes. And it's yeah. represent them popping out of like subway stations and sewer canals and things like that. And not only that, but they mesh well with most of the Imperial armies. Um, I mean, um, you Imperial Guard, yeah. just Imperial Guard. It's because, like I said, Private Joe and his squadron platoon they happen to all be gene sitters and they just opened up the armory to the rest of their buddies. Yep, yeah, but but they can cross ally. You can play gene stealer yeah. cults alongside Tyranids. Or you can play Gene Stealer Cults alongside Imperial Guard. Uh, or, sorry, how it, Astro how it was Imperial. before, if the Gene Stealer Cult was your primary army, you could take elements from both Tyranids and Guard. I don't know how it is anymore. I believe you can't have Tyranids and Guard anymore. It might be one or the other, but yeah, it used to be really cool. I believe they, they really said that you cannot have the Tyranid keyword and the Imperium keyword in the same... Uh, army. Yeah. So I believe you have to pick one to take from. Because I don't think Gene Stealer Cults have the Tyranny keyword. I believe they have the Gene Stealer Cults. They, they do have the Tyranny keyword, but there oh. could be something that says, hey, one or the other. Uh, I'm not too... I familiar. believe I believe there is. That's something that would probably need to be double-checked, but it does present some interesting opportunities. For instance, oh, yeah. you can take a Bane Blade from the Imperial Guard yeah. alongside Gene Stealer Cults if you so desire. You sure um, can. Or you could take some, you know, some stuff from the Tyranids list. You know, if you need some heavier fire support, you could take uh, Brood of Carnifexes from the Tyranid list. You know, take a, a patrol and or a, or a spearhead. Well, spearhead would require three separate choices, but you could take a patrol and grab, you know, a, an HQ like a Warrior Prime, a little squad of warriors, and some Carnifexes for a little heavier support. Yeah. Um, what well, is the the psych zoanthropes? I would take zoanthropes and have some blasty cannons, yeah, with some mind bullets. See, well, I'll tell you, uh, I think Gene Stiller cults are about a perfect mesh with Imperial Guard personally, a flavor wise. I mean, if you read the book, the books and stories about it, I mean, it just goes together like you know peanut butter and jelly. But uh, second, they fulfill a need really in bugs. What's that? <laughs> but uh. They fulfill a need that's not really met very well in the guard codex, um, and that is melee. I mean, Gene Stillers are really good at melee. Um, e even and, the, just their basic metamorphs are really good with their rock soft. They will carve through Space Marine squads. Yeah, exactly. Whereas uh, guard are infamously poor at melee. I mean, really, there's only one army that's any worse than them at melee, um, which we'll mention later. I mean, but, uh, Bulgrins are Bulgrins are pretty solid in melee. Yeah, but I, I'd say that's about it. I mean, I wouldn't take any other guards squad in, in a melee. You, you wouldn't gloriously charge your um, 
your uh, Tempestus Scions into the fray <laughs> for uh, the Ember Boys. I would I would gloriously shoot the 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 the, the stuff and add a whatever I would have insanely thought of possibly charging with the Tempest of ah, Come on now. You know in 3rd edition you wanted to make a whole Rough Rider army. Uh, you, you're right, I did, because Rough Riders are cool. And actually, that was actually that's, a guess. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds um, like something the Scotcho would uh, like. Um, actually, I had thought about making taking the Gene Steeler Colts Adeline Rough Riders or Outriders kit and making modern day rough riders with those because that'd be super cool. So for our listeners, if you don't know what these kits look like, basically think of a pack of uh hooligans riding around on dirt bikes with like pipes and chains going around oh, like smacking shotguns. people like that uh old Sega Genesis game Road Rash. Road yeah. Rash such but a good game. <laughs> take these models and then put guard trooper torsos and heads on them and then find some way to get a lance arm for them and that would be pretty sweet um, they would look pretty cool use them as Talleran rough riders have some dirt bikes in the desert yeah yeah absolutely um, no i i agree that gene Steeler colts go pretty well with guard but they go pretty well with tyrannids too i mean they they do work very well with either and uh, even a pure gene Steeler colts army is very very solid you have to play it very tactically Gene Steeler Colts are a very peanut butter army. Like they mesh well with either the Jelly of Guard or the Jelly of Tyrannids, or you just have your own peanut butter sandwich. Like they work really well with both. Like all three options are good. But what if I want peanut butter and bananas? Well, then you take Mm -hmm. Gene Steeler Colts and Space Marines, I guess. I don't (laughs) know. Um, But no, it it does allow for some interesting, you know, variations. Um, But yeah, all in all, no, Gene Stiller Colts, I think, were a very good addition to 40K. Oh, um, I agree. And they fleshed out something that hadn't really been filled in a whole lot before that. I mean, we knew about Gene Stiller Colts, but there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, deep lore about, you know, what goes on within them before that. No, there was an old army back in second edition. He had a couple models. Uh, they showed off a limousine which they never produced. They only made like one mock up for it and they had, they had an armored limo. But it's really cool to see GW taking these older ideas and like expanding them. Um, they did the same thing because they, they introduced Gene Slayer Colts when they reintroduced Death Watch to the game. They're the perfect um, enemies. And they they nailed it. They hit it out of the park with both the both the um, series oh, of models, though. And Gene Slayer Colts have gotten way cooler models. And I don't more. Know. That Corvus Death Star is pretty sweet. So. Uh, anything else on these Xenos factions? Um, with all three of these factions, they're very unique, I think, amongst the 40k armies. Because uh, they can all be played as hordes. Or you can have super elite armies. So with orcs, you can have hordes of boys. Or you can, you can have just lots of big dreads and stompas and robots. Can uh, with Tyranids, Thank you. with Tyranids, you can have swarms of the of the smaller creatures like um, Hormigons. like Termagants and Hormigons. or you can do uh, what we'd call the Godzilla armies of like tons of Carnifexes and Hive Tyrants and things like that. With the with the Gene Circles, you don't really have big monsters, but you can still mech up with lots of Ridge Runners and Atlan Jackals, and you can take their um, there was a list for a while called Muscle Beach, which was their big ab- abomination units, which are like basically ogre and gene stealers, or you could play Horde. So all three of these armies have um, very broad ways of playing. Yeah. That's not really prevalent in, I think, most of the other factions. No, you're, you're, you're right. Most of the other factions really are, they, they play a certain way. Um, I mean, Space Marines are Space Marines. You can do more mechanized Space Marines and regular Space Marines, but Space Marines are Space Marines. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, they, they, I, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're definitely right there. They, they really do embody multiple different play styles. Yeah, more than, more so than other armies. And actually, I would say that's kind of broadly um, true of all of the really Xenos factions. They don't, necessarily all embody the exact same 
play styles, but they all cater to multiple play styles. I think that's really good because with with um, Chaos and Imperium, you have such a plethora of codexes you can choose from. For the Xenos, if you're playing Orcs or Necrons, you can't really ally with other people, so you need that power and that balance in your own book. Yes. All right. Well, uh, we thank you for joining us for this session of the Armchair Generals. Uh, we will be back with uh, con further sections on the Eldar factions, as well as Necrons and Tau. Uh, remember, if you like this video, smash that like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss a down an upload from us. And remember, praise be the Forearmed Emperor. <laughs>